Welcome back. This is chapter 23, video number two. We're going to do exercise T from page 554. Um, we're going to use the T-table software or a calculator to estimate several things. The first one is the critical value of T for a 95% confidence interval with degrees of freedom equal to 7. I think the easiest thing is to use table T. So we're going to use table T. It's in your resource packet that I gave you, the, the bright pink one, or it is um, in the back of your book. You're going to find 95% confidence, and then you're going to go up to the row for 7 degrees of freedom, and there you'll see that T star is 2.365. Okay, we want to do the same kind of thing. We want the critical value of T for a 99% confidence interval with degrees of freedom equaling 102. So again, we use table T. We find 99% confidence, and then we look for the row with 102 degrees of freedom. We can't find it. So we use the conservative Price is Right approach. If you've ever seen the game show, The Price is Right, the contestant wannabes down at the front are shown an item and they have to guess the price of the item and whoever's closest without going over gets to come up and be the next contestant. All right, so we're going to do the same kind of thing. We go to the closest number of degrees of freedom without going over our desired degrees of freedom. So 100 is the closest without going over, so we use 100 degrees of freedom and we get T star equals 2.626. All right, now to find P values is going to be easiest to use our calculator. So uh, we're going to, and, and for that you'll just use TCDF. We want the P value for T less than or equal to 2.19 with 41 degrees of freedom. And so I, we use a CAS in our class. So for CAS, you go to Scratch Pad Menu, Statistics. This time you pick Distributions. We want TCDF. So since it's less than or equal to 2.19, our lower bound is negative infinity. Our upper bound is 2.19. And we tell it we want 41 degrees of freedom. And so we get a probability of 0.9829, roughly. And so that is our p-value. All right, now we're going to move on to example 14. Hoping to lure more shoppers downtown, a city builds a new public parking garage in the central business district. The city plans to pay for the structure through parking fees. During a two-month period with 44 weekdays, daily fees collected averaged $126 with a standard deviation of $15. What assumption must you make in order for, to use these statistics for inference? Well, we must assume the data are a representative sample of less than 10% of all weekdays, of all days that the um, parking garage would be open and available. Our sample is considered large enough, n equals 44, that the central limit theorem will apply. Write a 90% confidence interval for the mean daily income this parking garage will generate. Okay, so again, we're going to use our calculator to generate this confidence interval. So we go to scratch pad menu statistics, choose confidence intervals, and you want a T interval. All right, for data input methods, you've got two choices, data from a list or stats. Well, we have summary statistics. We have the actual average amount collected and the standard deviation. So that's what we're going to use. So choose stats and, and tell it OK. And then you're going to enter the menu items as prompted. For X bar, we have 126. S of X is just 15. And N is 44. The confidence level changed to 0 0.90 because we want a 90% confidence interval. Then tell it OK. And your C lower and C upper give you what is equivalent to $122.20 and $129.80. Interpret this confidence interval in context. We are 90% confidence based on this sample that the true mean daily income for the parking garage is between $122.20 and $129.80. Explain what 90% confidence means in this context. If we found many random samples and continued to use the same methods to produce confidence intervals, 90% confidence intervals, or of such intervals, would contain the true mean daily income. Just so you know, the context comes into play there with the statement about the true mean daily income. That makes it personal to this problem. 
The consultant who advised the city on this project predicted that parking revenues would average $130 per day. Based on your confidence interval, do you think the consultant was correct? Why? Well, no, the entire interval is below $130. So according to our um, confidence interval, $130 is not a plausible um, average. All right, suppose that for budget planning purposes, the city in exercise 14 needs a better estimate of the mean daily income for parking fees. Someone suggests that the city use its data to create a 95% confidence interval instead of a 90% confidence interval first created. How would this interval be better for the city? And we don't need to actually create the new interval. Just think about it. Well, thinking about it, the city would be more confident that the interval contains the true mean. Okay, now we have 95% confidence instead of 90% confidence. But how would the 95% interval be worse for the planners? Well, whenever you go up in confidence, you go down in precision. The interval is going to be wider, so it's less precise. So, you know, it, it actually gives you more possible values and makes it a little harder to plan. How could they achieve an interval estimate that would better serve their planning needs? Increase the sample size by collecting more data. Let more days go by, collect um, how much revenue is brought in, and then do your averaging. How many days worth of data would they, should they collect to have a 95% confidence of estimating the true mean within $3? That $3 there is a margin of error. And so this is a sample size problem. So margin of error equals 3. Our formula for margin of error is that it equals T star for n minus 1 degrees of freedom times s over square root of n. So that expression equals 3. But remember, we can't actually find T star for n minus 1 degrees of freedom if we don't know what n is. So we use Z star. Okay, we use Z star. So we're going to have Z star times s over square root of n equals 3. So we have 1.96 times 15, because that was the standard deviation for my, our sample that we have. It's the best thing we have to go on divided by square root of n equals 3. So I divide both sides by 1.96 and I got 15 over square root of n equals 3 over 1.96. So let's cross multiply to get 3 times um, square root of n equals 15 times 1.96 and let's see we divide both sides by 3 to get square root of n equals 15 times 1.96 over 3, and then we square both sides. Square and square root cancel for n, leaving us with just n, and then we have 15 times 1.96 all over 3 squared, which is equal to 96.04, and we always round up. We don't round to the nearest number, we round up. So n equals 97. So they really need data from 97 days. All right, so let's shift problems. A company with a large fleet of cars hopes to keep gasoline costs down and sets a goal of attaining a fleet of average um, of at least 26 miles per gallon. To see if the goal is being met, they check the gasoline usage for 50 company trips chosen at random, finding a mean of 25.02 miles per gallon and a standard deviation of 4.83 miles per gallon. Is there strong evidence that they have failed to attain their fuel economy goal? So our alternative is going to be what goes into them failing to attain their fuel economy goal which means that they would be getting less than 26 miles per gallon because their goal is that they have at least. So our null hypothesis is that mu equals 26, and our alternative is that mu is less than 26, where mu is the true um, fuel economy that this fleet is getting. Now, one thing I want to point out, because sometimes it confuses people, their null, what we're assuming, what we're, what we're saying, okay, yeah, that, let's assume that's true. Let's see how much evidence we have that mu is less than 26, if that's true. Um, remember, we write it as mu equals 26, but included in that is really greater than or equal to 26. So that's okay that the status quo that the company's correct is that it's greater than or equal to 26. We just write it as mu equals 26. That's just the way things are written. Okay, But remember, we're measuring evidence that they have failed to attain their goal. So that would be mu less than 26, because if their fuel economy is less than 26 miles per gallon, we have strong evidence for that, then they're failing their goal. 
Okay, are the necessary assumptions to make inferences satisfied? We have a representative sample that comprises less than 10% of the population, yet is large enough, n equals 50, that skew, skewness would not compromise the application of the central limit theorem. So even though we can't see our set of data, it really doesn't matter because the sample size is so large that central limit theorem is going to apply. Okay, we want to describe the sampling distribution model of mean fuel economy for the samples like this. So we want to say what kind of distribution it is, what the mean is, and what the standard deviation is. So since n is 50, the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So this is distributed with a t distribution with 49 degrees of freedom with a mean of 26 and a standard deviation of s over square root of n, so 40 over square root of 50. We want to find the p-value for our test. So we go to scratch pad menu statistics stat test. We're doing a t-test. Again, we've got statistics. They gave us the mean. They gave us the standard deviation of the individual values. So our null hypothesis mean is 26. Our mu naught is 26. Our x bar is 25.02. Our standard deviation of our x's is 4.83, and n is 50, and our alternative is that mu is less than mu naught, and we get a p-value of 0 0.0789. Explain what the p-value means in this context. If the true average fuel economy is 26 miles per gallon, then the chance of obtaining a, a sample mean of 25.02 miles per gallon or less by natural sampling variation is 8%. In other words, it happens just by chance 8% of the time. So let's state an appropriate conclusion. Due to our large p-value, because I would consider that large, there is insufficient evidence to reject the claim of a fuel economy of at least 26 miles per gallon. That is our null hypothesis. We can't reject it, and that's just stating it in um, the context of the problem. Now I'm actually going to answer, is this strong evidence that they have failed to attain their fuel economy goal? No, there is not strong evidence that the company has failed to attain their fuel economy goal. It's not strong enough for us even to reject it. So, may you know, we, the data are consistent with them having a fuel economy of at least 26 miles per gallon. Even though the sample average is lower, it's not far enough lower that we're sure it's due to something consistent, it's some pattern, and that it's not uh, due to just sampling variability, which is what we're saying it, you know, it could be. So we're not saying that the null is true, we're saying the data are consistent with the null. We can't rule it out. Okay, guys. Come ready to work some problems in class. I'll see you next time. Bye.